Mr. Chancellor, Chair of the Board of Governors, Madam President, graduates, and honored guests. Andre Pierre Picard is the public health reporter and columnist at the Globe and Mail newspaper. He is one of the best public health policy writers and health journalists in Canada and abroad. The light he shines on complex issues through his writing makes a positive difference on how the public, government, and policymakers work to achieve better health for all Canadians. When Picard received his journalism degree from this university in 1987, he already held an undergraduate degree in commerce from the University of Ottawa. Within days of his graduation, he began working at the Globe and Mail, Canada's highly respected national newspaper. It was there he found his passion for public health journalism. For the past 30 years, his commitment to highlighting issues that were overlooked, underreported, or simply out of the public's view is truly remarkable. He has shown how academic research in areas such as social determinants of health has a real place in the public's understanding of healthcare systems. While looking at broader definitions of health, he has shown how social isolation, poverty, prejudice, and outdated thinking can threaten the health of a nation. His approach to researching, documenting, and sharing health issues through the eyes of patients, healthcare workers, caregivers, all provide compelling insight into everyday challenges. His broad scope of research areas include mental illness, the nursing shortage, HIV AIDS, aging populations, Aboriginal health, and access to care. All have educated the public on relevant real world issues. While scholar in residence at the Conference Board of Canada, he completed a book on health care reform. He is the recipient of the Michener Award for Meritorious Public Service Journalism. The Pan American Health Organization honored him as the top public health reporter in the Americas. And the Canadian Public Health Association named Andre Picard Canada's first public health hero. There's more. The Canadian Mental Health Association the Canadian Hearing Society, Safe Kids Canada, and Alzheimer's Society of Canada have all honored his work. As an eight-time finalist for Canada's National Newspaper Awards and winner in 2010 for his public health columns, he is recognized for fair and balanced reporting and for producing stories that make a difference. His major investigative piece on Canada's public health disaster ushered in vital changes to Canada's blood delivery system. This is documented in Picard's first book, The Gift of Death, Confronting Canada's Tainted Blood Tragedy, first published in 1995. His newest book, entitled Matters of Life and Death, is a collection of 15 years of his opinion columns in the Globe and Mail, published just last month. Mr. Picard's clarity in communicating complex health research his commitment to fairness in practicing journalism, and his dedication to public health in the public interest is a rare combination. He continues to set an example of excellence for future generations of health science communicators and health journalists. Mr. Chancellor, in recognition of his extraordinary contribution to public health and public health policy as a journalist, columnist, and author of five significant books, I request that you confer the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa upon Andre Pierre Picard. By the Board of Governors and upon recommendation of the University Senate, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa. Congratulations. Uh, Mr. Chancellor, Chair of the Board, Madam President, honoured guests, graduands, and their family and friends, I'm really touched and humbled to receive an honorary degree from Carleton University, especially that I graduated here, as you heard, 30 years ago. But I missed my graduation. I was busy working. 
So thank you for letting me share a few moments with you today. And I'll be brief because I know what you really want is your degree and a job. Before I begin, I need to say a really special thank you to Catherine O'Hara for that very kind and citation. Old journalism hacks like us don't usually speak to each other with such kindness. But I think I can get used to this. I'm not sure if Catherine can. Now you're all scientists here graduating today. I'm a journalist, a health and science journalist. Our work is very different, but it has one fundamental similarity. Essentially, we tell stories. We observe, we ask questions, we formulate hypotheses, and sometimes we even find answers. We propose solutions. We unravel mysteries for people. And sometimes, if we do our jobs really well, and with a little luck, we make the world a better place. So I want to take the brief time I have today to speak about something that I hope matters to you as much as it matters to me, literacy, and more specifically, scientific literacy. Science has given us everything, everything from vaccination to iPhones, not to mention Pop-Tarts and fidget spinners. It's made our lives infinitely better. Never in history have we been more dependent on science and on technology. Yet, we've never been more skeptical and ill-informed. We live in a time when scientific illiteracy is disturbingly common, a time when ignorance is seen as a virtue, and self-serving opinions and conspiracy theories are passed off by, as facts, even by the most powerful man in the world. At no time in the history of humanity have we been healthier or safer, yet we live in fear, consumed by doubt, driven by a, glo a global crisis in trust. We don't trust the media, we don't trust politicians, and worst of all, we don't trust science anymore. We don't even trust facts, so we've invented this perversity called alternate facts. This is bad for democracy, and it's bad for our health. Facts, evidence, reason, logic, an understanding of science, these are good things. No nothingness should not be celebrated and rewarded. Science, technology, and innovation are increasingly important to our economic well-being and the quality of life, from preventing outbreaks of disease through to staving off the deadly impacts of climate change. Doing science, as all of you have spent years mastering and will continue to do, develops our ability to ask questions, collect information, organize and test our ideas, problem solve, and most importantly, apply what we learn. Science offers a powerful platform for building confidence, developing communication skills, and making sense of the world around us, a world that desperately needs some making sense of. But science is not only for scientists. The question and answer process at the heart of your education can help us shape our daily lives, forge a better future. Science is inclusive. Just look around this room. Regardless of culture, gender, race, social class, or religious beliefs, you're all learners, and you're all teachers. Science is also interdisciplinary. In the real world, outside the classroom and the lab, we don't section our lives into biology, chemistry, physics, math, and computer science. It's all just life. Science can also be found in history, geography, philosophy, sport, and more. Science is intertwined in the creative world of art, dance, and music. It allows us to understand how we hear music, how we move our bodies to dance, and how our eyes see art. Sometimes it's fun. I said a moment ago that you're all learners and teachers, and I want to elaborate a bit on the latter part, teaching. You're now university graduates, or you will be in a moment when I shut up. You're the privileged in society, and priv privilege affords you power. And with power comes great responsibility, as Voltaire said, or Spider-Man's Uncle Ben, depending on what you like to read. You have a responsibility to promote science and science literacy. You have to take every opportunity to translate scientific knowledge for a lay public and to demystify what you do, especially for the young. Our education system hasn't done a very good job of making science relevant or fun. As scientists, you can help change that. You also need to convince politicians and policymakers to invest in science, in the research enterprise. It's an easy argument to make, or at least it should be. After all, every dollar invested in health and science research 
provides a return on investment of $8.38. It's one of the best investments we can make. But we've starved science of research dollars, and in the process, we've made a career in scientific research unappealing and unaffordable for many. I know a lot of you are probably scared at that prospect. The practice of science, as you know better than I, can be mysterious and beguiling. But the manner in which science is funded is positively Rude Goldborgian. Science is a tough business. Success often takes decades, not days. That makes it a tough sell in an impatient world looking for simplistic solutions to complex problems and where opinions masquerade as facts. But the only way we'll solve our problems is with science and innovation, not with magical thinking. Now, a convocation speech is supposed to inspire, to deliver wisdom. I'm not sure I've done that so far. But I hope I've helped you convince you, or at least remind you, that by choosing a science education and science as a career, that you've made an inspired choice, despite all the challenges. In my work, I get to meet many brilliant people, from Nobel laureates like Françoise Barry Sinoussi, uh, scientific entrepreneurs like Bill Gates, and gifted science communicators like Neil deGrasse Tyson. If there's one thing they all agree on, is that you'll never succeed if you don't take risks. In fact, every good scientist I've ever met has stressed the importance of failing, and failing repeatedly. Failure isn't a dirty word in our society, or it shouldn't be, at least. We bu yet, we bubble wrap our children for fear that they'll fall down and get hurt, and that's become a metaphor for modern life. What we should fear, however, is not falling down, but a lack of ability to get back up. Failure doesn't really matter. What matters is what happens next, how we learn from failure, resilience. The famed innovator Thomas Edison said it well, and I quote, I've not failed 10,000 times. I've not failed even once. I've succeeded in proving that 10,000 ways did not work. When I've eliminated the ways that did not work, then I proceeded to find the way that did. That's your challenge in science every day. The other consistent lesson from the greats of science and business and the arts is to do work that you love, work that doesn't feel like work. Follow your, your heart if you want a more cliched image. You leave here today not only with a degree, but with a, long, a lifelong gift, the ability to learn and hopefully a thirst to excel. Many people will tell you that you need a plan, that you need to map out your career plan. You have to do that in a hurry. But I don't agree. I'm going to end by telling you the exact opposite. You're entering the job market at a time when the economy is struggling and when it seems the world has gone mad. But you're also entering a world of infinite possibilities and continuous change. It's a world of opportunity where science and technology will shape the future, where you will actually shape the future. So don't limit yourself. Don't fear, don't fear straying off the beaten path and failing and taking risks. There's an African proverb that says, to get lost is to learn the way. So I guess the best advice I can give you today is get lost. Get lost and who knows what you'll find. Congratulations to you all and thank you for this honor.